I'm not sure who's speaking. Who would like the mic? We'll oh, we'll pass it around you'll pass it. Okay. Pass it around. So we started out very ambitiously thinking that we could just sort of plug in courses randomly and add dates, but then Wayne came and sat at our table and completely sort of deconstructed our, our uh, theory here. Um, I feel like I'm back in grad school. Um, so basically what we did identify, however, is the good news is um, if we look at this in terms of having a viable product so that uh, a student starting in with OERU would be able to see their way through 10 courses, just 10 as a minimum, and we'd be able to receive those credits, transfer credits, or plow those credits into our certificate, I think we're probably within reach of, say, mid-2019. Um, because I look at it this way. For 10 courses, we already have three right off that list because we have two and Kwantlen has one and we already articulate with each other, right? So the other seven, I'm just sitting down with Mark. Where did Mark go? There he is. Um, we're going to work together because Mark, out of, out of uh, Thomas Edison, there are seven courses there that when we look at the list, either equate course for course with courses we already offer or would give be, we'd be assigning unassigned credit. And Gail's shaking her head because, you know, corporate communications, which is a course that Gail worked on, we already know that. We, and we teach an identical course, uh, well, two courses that would be very close to that. So it's not going to take us, I think, an extreme length of time, I think, to work out this agreement. And we're actually going to start drafting that document very soon, actually before Christmas. I'm, I'll commit to that if Mark will, and then, um, and then in the new year, work through course for course. If it mean, mean, means me visiting Jersey, I will. And, uh, you know, maybe a little trip in January, someone, February would be someone fun. <laughs> someone has to do it, or, Mar or Matt. You know, we're, we're the sort of project leads here. We'll figure it out. But I, I think, you know, yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, from my point of view, from, from, the per from the institute that would be credentialing the student with a certificate, I think we're, we're, we're getting very close. Um, now for the certificate in higher education in business. in business, it's a little bit less close, it's less imminent, so I'm gonna let you explain. Okay, thanks. Um, well, we're going to go with the, the start date that Wayne had for the, um, for the LIDA course, because that's one of the courses in the business course. And we're currently looking at an articulation agreement between Otago Polytechnic and um, UHI. So the documents have been drawn up, but we've just got to make a few changes there. We're also looking at an articulation agreement with uh, Mark and TESU because there's courses there that are going to be part of that. So um, Mark, our registrar is going to head, <laughs> come and talk to you. I, I don't think physically they'll phone, the, phone you up, <laughs> but, uh, but that will be uh, coming your way. So we're happy to start with with LIDA and we'll um, market that as being the first course in the uh, business studies course. And then we're thinking about a two month release of courses. So we've already got, um, now this, this is gonna be UK credits, so it's gonna sound an enormous amount to a lot of you, but we've got um, something like 68 credits of courses already completed either by Otago Polytechnic or TESU. Now that equates to half a first year in UK speak. So, <laughs> so we've got half a first year and to, to, um, uh, to award the certificate, they have to do the other half of first year at UHI. And those are the three um, introduction to business, introduction to customer centered business, and introduction to operations management. Now, because I've got to write all of those three courses, uh, and because my next step is to try and get our systems to cope with um, uh, OERU students, because if we enroll a student at the moment, it's going to think that there's somebody who's going to study at UHI, so, so that's a problem. So we've got to reprogram some of our systems. Um, and, uh, that starts in two weeks' time. Um, once I've got that done, only then will I be able to start writing our three courses. So our three courses will come in at the end of that launch schedule. So I'm looking at uh, January, February 2019 for the final three courses to come in. Um, but there's many 
choices from the other two institutions. Uh, so the student can start on that journey with, uh, with February, isn't it, Wayne? Um, but the line, of course. So that will be when the business journey starts. And we're also going to discuss an articulation agreement um, with Brenda as well, because then uh, you would take some of our business courses, those three, and they would articulate into that. So I think we got it cracked. I think we're close. <laughs> yeah. I think, did you want to add anything, Matt? I think you know yeah. Wayne, you might want to add in more information. I don't know. Well, no, was okay. We're okay. I'll summarize again. Okay. Thanks. Did we capture, though? the? Okay. All right. Thank you. So over to marketing to hear what they're going to do about all of this. I can't speak to yeah. it. <laughs> I have the notes. Okay. Uh, so our goal for this session was to look in more detail at our potential audience for the courses and the programs, as well as to look at the key messaging that we would use to communicate this to them. Um, what we talked about was we still have too broad of an audience really to start developing our key messages. So we need to narrow that down and we want to do that without guesswork. So we know that there have been some people who have already taken a questionnaire that they filled out before and possibly after they did a course. So we'd like to get our hands on those questionnaires and start to look at developing some personas for who will be taking these courses. Um, once we have a better idea of the personas, we can look at the key messages and the tone and the, um, the approach we want to take. Um, we also really, one of the first steps that we want to make before we start promoting this is make sure that the website is set up so that it's... Um, it contains communications that's appropriate to the learner. Right now it's still very much focused on institutions and communicating what the OERU is. So the personas will help um, finalize our recommendations for the website, but right now some of the things we discussed was looking at dividing it into sections for course takers versus credential completers, um, as well as providing information on micro-credentialing testimonials from successful students and looking at incorporating uh, visual information as much as possible. So infographics, videos, avoiding sort of large pieces of text where learners can get lost. Uh, we'd also like to look if possible at Google Analytics or whatever open source equivalent we may have on the website and that'll help us determine recommendations for segmenting the site as well. Anything? Just one question. Uh, yeah. just one day. Um, I, I noticed your. Oh, sorry. Um, one question because I, I, I don't understand these things particularly well from a technical side. I, I noticed your reaction when we said Google Analytics. Um, and I was just wondering whether or not um, you wanted to elaborate on, on what kind of analytics are actually available to us, what kind of information about visitors to the website and, and about the learners. I can just tell you that um, at the moment there is Google Analytics uh, as much as we are trepidation about using it. Um, we also have been looking at um, Google, um, the, the, the tagging functionality that Google has as well, which uh, again, we're also a little bit concerned about. What we're actually looking at doing is, is using both at, at the same time Google Analytics and also um, probably PWIC, which is a open source alternative to that and um, quite widely used. And so we're looking at sort of slowly making a transition away from it so that we're not putting kind of user demographic and user um, usage patterns in Google systems and instead in a trustworthy um, storage with associated with PWIC instead. But we do have, we should, we do have quite a lot of historical data, although we need to go and find it all. <laughs> and can, you, can you spell P-I-W-I-K okay. dot org, I believe, or dot net will give it, get it to you. Get, get you. Oh, David, you can keep it because ah. you're up next with oh, dear. technology roadmap. Does somebody? Else? <laughs> I, I haven't got my computer in front of me, unfortunately, because it's currently recording the sound over there. Oh. Um, <laughs> 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 
It was a wide ranging discussion. Yeah, we, yeah. <laughs> we may have gone off. <laughs> I think you've got it in front of you, Nick. Yeah. Well, I've got in front of me what we wrote, um, which may be quite different to what we actually discussed. Um, so we spent most of our time brainstorming around um, how to use the technologies that we have and also thinking about um, some potential other things that might be gaps or that things that people might be interested in bringing into the technology suite. Um, and the other thing that we talked a little bit about was how to create a series of, uh, I guess, stories uh, or um, what do we call them? Uh, I can't remember what we call them. Testimonials or um, rationales. That was the word that we used. Rationales for for the selection of each of these tools that we have so that if we have to justify them to someone else, then we would be able to do so. Um, and the other thing was to provide some pedagogical feedback for each of the tools. So something like a matrix that, uh, that shows you uh, you're trying to do this or you want your learners to do this. These are the tools that we have in place to, to help you do that. Um, yeah, and then we talked a little bit about what the process might be for adding additional pieces to the stack if you come across something that you need um, or are interested in. Um, we didn't actually get to the point of prioritizing anything, uh, but we generated a lot of ideas. We'll do a guest post on the blog. Right, right. Yeah. yes, we talked about um, doing a guest post on the blog. Um, if you find something that you think is cool that fits the, the idea of the tools being technologically um, and ethically credible sources that could be in, it could be added to the technology stack. The partners are invited to do that. Yeah, so the partners would be invited to do that if you come across something or if you see a gap in the technology stack that you need something for. Does that cover? So I think that was it. Yep. So we're going to end with, to me it always sounds a little ominous, but due diligence. Where are they? They must be here. Oh, sorry. No, it's okay. We've got time. Well, it's fresh. <laughs> Just a simple question in terms of hosting the uh, all the services. Do you have something in place for that? Uh, okay. I was just going to say... Be Dave is nodding. I mean, I'm... Knowing Dave, I'm sure you've got it all on hand. It's just I don't know if you're aware that BC has a, a very major edu. It's called Edu Cloud um, service that could be available for something like this. Who's due diligence? Oh. Okay. Thank you. Um, well, we um, talked fairly widely and broadly about the the due diligence requirements, if you like, to, um, to get things up and running. Um, we put down a, a number of points that we raised, we found fitted under more than one heading. So uh, things that should be on the course site also needed to either be on the uh, OARU site or there needs to be links from one to the other um, so that um, all the essential information can be provided. Um, a few things that came up, we felt that there should be, for instance, on the course site links to uh, the course guide that was mentioned earlier this morning by and produced by UHI and it should be adapted for TRU and uh, that's particular certificate if necessary. Uh, obviously, any of the courses that are going to be launched need to have a final proof of their kind of operational structure and um, all the links. Uh, that exist in those courses need to be checked and probably updated from time to time. Um, we need to, um, it needs to be quite clear for the learner what sort of steps are required for when they want to seek some assessment services and the prices that they're um, going to have to um, pay. Uh, the um, course will need to establish a payment portal um, including enrollment and completion timeframes. We had a bit of a debate around that because um, some institutions were happy for students to start and finish at any time, uh, whereas others said no, it had to be kind of completed within a particular time frame. Um, so that, that's something that should be specified pretty clearly for students. 
Um, we needed to provide information about what they will get at the end of completing a course or a micro course. So I'm some sort of issuing a certificate of course completion rather than the full certificate, which would normally be like an academic transcript perhaps. But there may be issues if um, we're talking micro-credentialing, there may be some issues with institutions uh, issuing academic transcripts for micro components of courses. Um, we thought that um, we'd add to the list, uh, we, we mentioned right up front that we do think it's essential that the website is updated on a very regular basis. I'm sure people are conscious of that. There was a bit of discussion around uh, our great support for free and open source software, uh, but recognition that a lot of these software packages are going to be completely foreign to um, students who are coming into the use of OERU courses. So some sort of tutorials are going to have to be accessible for a lot of that um, uh, free and open source software. Um, Again, an enrollment guide for award completion will be necessary for those two awards that we've got on, <coughs> on offer at the moment. Um, and we need to add the course guides, uh, as mentioned earlier, but and a link back to the course site or whatever. Um, so some of this is kind of repeated because we think it should be on both course sites and OERU site. We thought there should be a flow chart of credit transfer partners and guides for these programs. Um, we thought it should be quite clear uh, as to when the launch will occur and, um, and um, when that will be finalized and it should be communicated quite clearly to everyone. And um, a, perhaps a table of prices should be published um, so that students know what they're in for from a free point of view right up front. Um, yeah, certainly credit transfer agreements need to be signed off by the CEO of the institutions. Um, marketing collateral for assessment services uh, needs to be available. Uh, and we also thought that internally uh, within our institutions, uh, there need to be very good internal communications and information conveyed because we anticipate that there could be some issues arrived from this and one of them is related to industrial relations. I know we ran into this ourselves a couple of years ago um, when we started talking about Academic Volunteers International um, and unions started saying, hey, um, what are you doing? You know, you're um, undermining the fact that academics need to get paid for these sorts of services. So it's just an example of the sort of issues that could arise internally within institutions. So we, we thought um, quite uh, uh, good communication and information well distributed throughout the institution um, would probably allay some of those concerns and overcome some of those issues that may arise. Okay, uh, we did put down just one thing probably an issue for consideration by the CEOs um, further down the track than currently exists. But the issue was one of um, establishing or talking about comparable pricing for courses, uh, because we envisaged that um, you know, one institution might offer assessment services for $300, and another one might offer assessment services for that course for $100. Um, and so that's going to create a competitive situation amongst the partner institutions. Um, and um, we need to keep be mindful of the fact that, uh, you know, the original proposal was that assessment services and so on and the provision of these courses to students would largely be on a cost recovery basis. Um, so that's a, an issue for the CEOs to debate at some point, I believe. Uh, and that's about it at the moment. Look, I think it's an, exhaust, an exhaustive type of checklist. It could be with minor details to be added here and there. Thank you. We've all been now well conditioned to do feedback within five minutes. It's a wonderful talent. Great sterling facilitation.
chat as a virtual participant. Yeah, if you can. Yeah, sure. Um, so uh, Paul has said, uh, sorry, I can't scroll it. Yeah, thanks. Yeah. Okay, that uh, that, and this may also um, fall into the, um, the the most recent section discussed there. Um, that um, we could look at uh, using <laughs> blockchain or block certs based on the blockchain for certification. And uh, he's offered to pro he's actually provided a link there, which might provide some insight into how that might work. But uh, yeah, that would be interesting. It'd be interesting. I mean, yeah, we can talk about that if people want to. Paul, thanks for the contribution. So the question, the question to the group is, what is the decision proposal that comes out of this? That we take to the CEs. It's a hard one. So my thinking around this is, what is clear is there, there are many interdependencies right? You kind of can't do the marketing until you know what the launch schedule is. Um, it's hard to put in the checklist for the marketing stuff until you know what the marketing plan is, right? Um, it, it's complex. Different institutions have different, you know, procedures around all of these things. So my gut feel is the decision proposal recommendation should be to develop the project plan, to develop a project plan for the launch of the OERU first year of study by the end of November. For example, you know, the OER Foundation will compile an initial plan, of course, openly and transparently in the wiki, right, for everybody to see, um, so that we can plan, you know, you know, put a bit of project management into action and, and load this with the bits and pieces that can be, that can be achieved, taking capacity, uh, capacity constraints into account. Would that be a fair proposal to put forward to the CEs? Or should we be thinking of something else? I think, I guess that works from my point of view, provided that we, we understand that, you know, the deliverables, the dates, through which something is going to be delivered is, is going to vary. You know, we can't, we can't be held like I'm ideally, you know, I'm hoping within reason when I look at the load of work this is going to take, um, provided I'm given institutional support to do this amount of work off my desk um, over the next six months, you know, um, should another something more urgent come across my desk that's going to take me away from it, then, then, you know, things change. But, you know, within reason, I'm trying to manage my, everyone has to manage their own time, you know, and adjudicate how much time you can spend on something like this. And I feel confident that our university is very very much invested in this project. Um, as I said before, we have a good team that we rely on, and Matt and I are, you know, as best as we can, uh, we'll be working to bring this to fruition. Um, but at the same time, there's other forces that enact on our jobs, you know. But I think that um, what will be really interesting, I think, is the fact that our provost is coming next week. She'll be at the uh, meeting on Monday. And, um, you know, everything so far we've been told is, all, all steams ahead, you know, keep, keep, keep at it, in other words. Um, so I, I like the idea of creating an overarching project plan, provided it's kept open-ended. I think those are very important points, and true to the open source philosophy that uh, the CAN board project plan, our partners will have account access on that with full autonomy to change de delivery dates uh, when and if needed. Uh, because we need to do that because the beauty of these systems is then we can see the interdependencies and how we can, you know, what we need to reschedule. We might do another course at another, you know. Um, but yes, all the partner institutions, we, I mean, we will discuss with the partner institutions for the contact point um, and, you know, for the, you know, access to the CAN board. But you will have full authority on, you know, to change dates and because things come up, right? Yeah. Yeah. Does that make sense? Gail. 
I'm just wondering at this very crucial point where we want to launch, like this is the sixth time, and I think it's David. Someone said, we need students, we need to get this show on the road. So I'm just wondering if the time has come to put some money, probably from all the partner institutions, to hire some folks to do some of this work that has to get done. For example, the website. Like, I don't know if Dave has, if Dave alone can do everything that we had on that list for technology. So is the time right to just spend a little money and get certain things done quickly so we could get the show on the road quickly? Because all of us here have good intentions and we are so invested and so interested, but we have other jobs. And that's been the reality of the whole OERU from the beginning, as far as I can tell. Erwin and I, we're so invested, but we have other jobs and other priorities. So we've always felt guilty that we haven't done what we promised to do. But it's a reality we're going to have to face that. And I think the time is now. Let's just spend some money and get certain things. We have all these lists of things to do, editing all the courses, looking through. But do we have the time? Even if Wayne were to put out to the, to the whole consortium tomorrow, does anybody have time to take a look through all the courses and ensure people will want to do it, but they won't have the time? And so I think we should just get some people who have those skill sets we need and just get it done quickly. I mean, I think, I think that's a, a good suggestion. My immediate response is I think we need to have a plan A and a plan B, so to speak. Plan A is what does a launch schedule look like without additional resource, okay? Um, because we do have a number of courses that are at the point that they can go live, right? Yeah. Um, with minimal work, we you know, can adapt the OERU website to a point that will be good enough um, you know, to get a, you know, get a launch going, right? Because we are targeting minimum viable products, which is not a full feature set, right? And, and we take an iterative approach. Plan B is, well, if we had X amount of dollars, we could do this by that date, you know, for this audience, so that our partners have choices. Uh, because I suspect that the situation at different institutions around budget, uh, around their own motivations for being in OERU might be different. And we need to cater for that flexibility across the network is my sense. So that we, that we give the CEs at the individual institutions the choices that they can take, but based on sound information. I don't know. I'm, you receive, what would your thoughts be? <laughs> Don't want to put you on the spot. Okay. Um, yeah, it's interesting. I've been sitting and listening to all of this. The, um, and there's some really, some really important points have been made. The problem you've got from the, the CEO perspectives, and I was talking to Wayne yesterday about this, is that we've been quite a number of years getting to this point, And I'm, his, He's right about you know the plan A and plan B. If we had lots of money, we could do a lot of marketing, but we don't have that money at the minute. And we may be able to get some money out of some of the institutions. So for example, my own institution, we've actually invested quite a bit over the last couple of years in this. But we need to see some sort of movement because I think we will start to lose good faith. And, and this is my, I think it's my fourth, fourth meeting. Um, and you can see there's been quite a change in people and, and people coming through. There's new people coming through, which is good. But we, I'm not seeing the same number of CEOs that there were three or four years ago. Um, and I'm asking why. Why is that? Um, they're going to want, they're in a very different position. They're going to want to see what am I, what's the return in all of this? That they're doing? Not necessarily in terms of cash, but they want to see something launched, something going. So I'd actually argue, and I'll argue this at the meeting on Monday, that we need to get some sort of students in place. Um, and I think we should be looking at adapting the, the website 
do something. Because it's great to do all the things that we've talked about, and it was wonderful hearing all of this, but we just don't have time to do all this. And because I think we'll just run out of steam. Um, so we need to get something. And there are competitors out there, and things are starting to move. When you think back the last three or four years, the world is now a very, very different place around OER and everything than it was three or four years ago when we had this, this grand vision and this, this grand plan to do these things. So we really do need to start doing And even if we don't have, I wouldn't worry too much about the detail of a lot of this stuff, you know, because we'll, we'll just drag ourselves into the mud talking about, oh, support here, support there, what do we do? Let's just get some students. And then once we get students and they're going, we can figure out then how we actually support them and all the other things that we need to do to go with that. So that's, that's what my views will be. And I'll articulate that on Monday with the other chief executives when they're there. Thanks for that, Clive. Um, Evan? Yeah. Uh, and I'm thinking, I mean, uh, these are all pieces that need to happen. There's no question about that. Uh, one of the things that I think we could probably do uh, at Open Learning is uh, get started very quickly, as long as there is a course or two in place that we can start where that has minimal new work to be done. Uh, in other words, that we've got the exams, we've got all the assessments, the course is fully ready, and it's using our, all our existing processes. We did that with the first student. We worked with David on that. And uh, um, if we could say, well, well, we'll find half a dozen students who can take one or two of these courses. I don't know, you know, Matt would have to think that one through, Brenda too, or so on. But using all our existing processes, if a student just wanted to come in and write one of our exams, so we don't have to have all the agreements in place, we could probably start that pretty quickly, say half a dozen students. Now we've got a flow while we're building things around them. They, you know, and and uh, as we did with the one student who already went through, uh, we just uh, subsidized them so they didn't have to pay anything. So they're getting free three credits. Um, and um, so, you know, there's a bonus for them as well, too. So maybe that's something we could consider, uh, give that a try. and it, it, it's, It'll start generating momentum and discussion and we'll sort of learn as we go. It's kind of like uh, design research, I guess, yeah. some kind. Yeah, and on, on, the, on the positive side, I'll, I'll hand over to Brenda now. On, on the positive side, we have 900 hours worth of business courses that can launch tomorrow. So, I mean, we, we, we are in a strong position. And, you know, it's we on the edge of, you know, getting the final sign-off on the articulation agreements so we can get that launch schedule going. So, we do have a lot to move with um, on, you know, on the positive side and, you know, start getting the students into the system. So... It's getting all the other bits and pieces together as well. Um, I can I can appreciate the argument, Gail, about uh, getting some external funds, but I guess for, from my point of view, the the kind of work that needs to be done from from my office, no one else can do. What Matt has to, you know, instructional design work, perhaps course design work. Yes, if there's if that work still has to be done, I could see that being funded perhaps at UHI. <laughs> so just. <laughs> um, but uh, actually, just to follow up on what Erwin said, the psych course that we offer, for example, actually that's a mandatory course for our students doing a major in psych. So it, everyone has to take that. <laughs> so that's, that's an easy one to, to maybe perhaps, uh, yeah, we have the exam ready already. So that would be an easy one to launch. Sounds good. Right, last comment before we move on. Okay, so I agree with everyone that we want to get something launched as soon as possible. So I suppose my comment was, I got a little scared when I heard that to market, for example, to even just launch January two courses, I was getting scared that even something like marketing, we can't do too much until, and, and you said everything seems to be interconnected or fixing the website, we got away from this group. I, I was starting to get scared that, oh my gosh, are we not gonna just get going and launch at least one or two? But if the intent is, like that list of checklists is, things for January versus long-term things that have to get done, then I'm starting to breathe. I'm like, okay, we are gonna launch something very soon. 
then I'm starting to breathe. And there are many, so the, the list can actually get divided into a low hanging fruit versus yeah, yeah. good things to get done over the long term. Okay, thanks. And, and, and that's a very good point, Gail. And my thinking around the project plan was to actually do that. You know, learning in the digital age gets launched in February. Uh, the marketing starts in, on whatever marketing we've got, starts eight weeks before that. Uh, in April, the first four or the first three, you know, the business courses, they go to market. That's more time to, you know, develop the marketing stuff and just develop a plan like that okay. uh, based on what, you know, capacities we have available and, you know, get to market. I mean, I'm not sure what the CEs are going to uh, recommend at the meeting, but I know at the last meeting, the targets were, were not overly ambitious. They were around 100 learners completing an award within two years. We're talking about 2,000 assessments. The CEs may want to change those objectives at the meeting, and, and that's fine. But the initial thinking at the last meeting was, you know, conservative targets. I mean, if more happens, we can accommodate that. I mean, this is the beauty of the model. Um, so, generally, are, are you comfortable with the proposal, you know, get this place, you know, this project plan done by the end of November for this phased launch schedule uh, that is achievable with the capacity constraints we have. I think the key is um, after we've launched the learning in the digital age, we must have um, student feedback. We must be able to Absolutely. work on that student feedback before we start launching two months later with the business school. So we've got to build that into the project plan because it's not going to be plain sailing. Absolutely, and that's an, an amazing segue into the next session, which is, a, is exactly about this stuff. So, so basically what this next session is uh, about is uh, planning the, 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 the process evaluation, which is really about gathering this data from the launch of the courses to inform the decision making for the, you know, the phased launch of what's, uh, of what's happening. I can, uh, we've got a high level process evaluation plan. The researcher has been appointed uh, Dr. Angela Murphy, who actually ran the context e evaluation. Um, so the high, the high level plan is there in the wiki. I'm not going to go into all the detail. Um, we're, we're looking at getting information from the three stakeholder groups, the learners, of course, which is an important piece of all this. Uh, the folk who have been engaged in developing the courses, right? The, uh, the course designers, the, the technical support people, uh, in implementing this MVP to get that feedback in terms of where we can improve. And of course, the OERU partners, right? So we've got the, the different stakeholder groups. Uh, there will be uh, online surveys for the, for the different groups, but also a number of qualitative interviews. Uh, two learning design consultants, two subject matter experts, you know, two partner organizations who actually assembled OERU courses. Um, senior leaders, uh, you know, like one or two CEs, uh, to get you know to get that uh, to get that input. So that's a high level uh, process evaluation plan. The real challenge here is that this phase is not to get into the product evaluation because we don't have the full product yet. This is part of you know the the process of implementing the first year of study. And the purpose of this session would be to start brainstorming some of the survey items. For those different stakeholder groups, right? Um, what we do have in place uh, is what we call the OERU New Participant Survey, uh, or that's the previous one that was. So we've got data from all the, uh, the the prototype courses that we ran, 
Uh, there was the new participant survey as well as the course evaluation survey. So we've got an initial draft to work from in terms of tweaking that survey for the, you know, the refinements of the OERU model. And we have the new version of the new participant survey, which I've just loaded there. It's, this is available online, on Lime survey, but I've just given the PDF version because it might be easier to work with here in this. Uh, in this context, um, oh no, this is the online version, but you get the idea. It's standard demographic information, which countries they're coming from, you know, where, you know, which regions of the world, you know, do they reside? Are you in full-time employment? You know, that kind of, you know, information which will help us, uh, you know, understand the market a bit better. You know, how many hours are they working? These kinds of questions. What is the highest, highest qualification? and so on and so on. Getting a bit of background in terms of, you know, with the experience in online learning, right? Uh, what sort of technologies have they, you know, been using? You know, do you have experience with, you know, other open online courses? Why are you taking this course, right? So I'm not going to go through all, you know, going through all the items. You know, we've got we've got this uh, a question here, trying to establish motivations for learners actually engaging in an OERU course. Um, so we, you know, it will be this iterative process, and this, of course, will also help inform the marketing initiative. Um, you know, as we get going, we're going to get more data, more information to help us refine the model, tweak our marketing, and so on. That's kind of what we've, got, uh, what we've got in place. You know, how did you find out about us, right? And of course, you know, sort of the open items. There will also be for each course an evaluation survey. So, I mean, we'll, we'll work with the first, you know, draft of that, and that will also be getting uh, input back. So, Andy, your question is, we will have that evaluation survey from the leader uh, folk. And then, of course, you know, we'll be doing that for all the courses as we go along. So that's kind of where we're at at the moment. And what we're keen to do during this session is, yes, of course. Yep. So uh, we do what we can with what we have. No, and I'm, I'm being very serious about it. So we've got a lot of uh, quantitative data, that is relatively easy to process and move forward. In terms of the qualitative data, if we don't have uh, enough people to do it, we've got the data, right? What is happening in OER is an increasing number of PhD students who are actually doing the, the PhD work on the OERU. And we've, we've got at the moment at least two uh, PhD students working on OERU-related studies. And this is the kind of data um, that is well suited for postgraduate study. And as an open organization, we would be very keen to encourage any postgraduate students, if you've got a postgrad that is wanting to do research in this space, uh, we, we will make this data openly available. I mean, in, when you sign up to this form as a respondent, you are committing to releasing this data to the public domain, even though there's no copyright on, on, on data. Uh, we make sure that the, the respondents are aware that you're helping make the OERU a better place. Yeah. Okay. So the purpose of this session is basically just to break out into um, these three groups. Bunch of folk to look at, just to brainstorm a couple of questions for the potential survey for the process evaluation for course developers. Gail will lead that group. OERU learners, for the process evaluation, what questions should we be asking the learners, right? And then, uh, and that, that group will be all, oh, Erwin, can I, Erwin, would you be able to convene that group because Stephanie is not well today? Thank you, so, sorry for, uh, I should have spoken to you earlier on, I just realized that now. Uh, and then the OERU partners, what questions should we be asking the OERU partners and, and Mark will facilitate that group. So just a quick show of hands, in, if folk who are interested in generating questions for learners. 
Anybody interested in generating? Ah, so we, yeah, that's a viable group. Uh, folk who want to generate questions for course developers for the survey. We've got a couple there. Yeah, that's a viable group. And then for the OERU partners. Okay, so that's a viable group. All right, so we shall we have the OERU partners. Mark, you don't need to move um, at the back there. Learners, David's table. And the other group was the... Uh, not the marketing, the partners, the uh, the course developers. Uh, we'll sit here. I oh, know, Gail, because the marketing the marketing group is still going to be working. So if you can take that table there, yeah, the one there, because the marketing group is still still having the marketing group, and I'll come and have a chat with the marketing uh, marketing group right now, so we can pause.